Welcome back to On the Trail to Skull Hill. As you know, we have been going through the Lenten season, looking at different images and themes along the way in Jesus's journey to the cross. And this week, we look at the cross itself. You see the remarkable claim by the book of John, as we think of the gospel authors, each illuminating something that we need to see about the story of Jesus. John suggests that in the cross is revealed the glory of God. Richard Bauckham explores this at length in his book. We're going to be dialoguing with it today. He's an excellent scholar. His book, Gospel of Glory, explores John's contribution to our view of what happened at the cross. Richard Bauckham shows that John is attempting to show that God's glory is seen most clearly at the cross. Remember what we're talking about. We're talking about the most humiliating, excruciating style of capital punishment available in the Greco-Roman world. The crucifixion, as you will remember, is where criminals had their hands pierced onto a wooden cross, and sometimes they would carry it themselves up to the hill, and they could be beaten, they could be lashed, they could be stabbed, and then as they were hoisted up on this cross, they had to stand on this block of, of wood or maybe their legs were nailed together at the base and if they would have to come up to get a breath. Eventually the victims of crucifixion would die of asphyxiation. Uh, maybe a blood loss uh, as at all contributed. It was a slow and painful death and Jesus' death is, is actually rather quick for a crucifixion as we know that Jesus himself is surrendering himself. But how could this form of punishment somehow show the glory of God? So that is why we're going to wade into John to see the cross afresh with the help of Richard Bauckham as we witness the glory of God at the cross of Christ on Skull Hill. Richard Bauckham says of the cross, what happens is just always what happens at crucifixions and all their pain and humiliation. And yet, the cross as the supreme enactment of God's love is also the supreme revelation of his glory, of who he is. How does the cross show us who God is? Help us, John. So Bauckham traces through some observations in the book of John and he talks about this concept of the hour. Jesus references this throughout the book and what is being referred to here, the hour, the hour, the time, what is what is coming that Jesus is seeing in front of him? Well, we know that the gospel account, it points us towards Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. And what is being referred to, the hour, is what unfolds on Skull Hill. So let's read a few passages from John. In John 12, 23, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. 17, 1, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son so that the Son may glorify you. As we see what Jesus is, is facing in his hour of trial and what is going to take place on the cross, he sees it as a way to not only glorify God, but to be glorified. What is going on here? How on earth is the most humiliating of deaths going to do anything to glorify God? Maybe this will help a little bit. Richard Bauckham says, in John's use of the verb glorify, the two meanings of glory, honor, and splendor coincide. What is meant for God's glory, honor, displays his glory, splendor, the double meaning characterizes both cross and exaltation. There is honor in the humiliation of the cross and splendor in the degradation of the cross. There is honor in the vindication of the resurrection and splendor in the Son's return to heavenly glory. So we're trying to get a sense here of this construct of honor and glory and how this would have been understood. 
for Richard Bauckham, this all comes back to some key words that open the book of John, that God is showing his grace and his truth. For Bauckham, as he attends to the text of John, he makes the case that John is helping us to see God's glory as his character. And it all comes back to a key word pair that John opens his gospel account with. We read it in John 1, 17. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Christ. Now this word pair, grace and truth, actually comes from an episode in the Bible in which God reveals his glory, his name, his reputation, his character to Moses. And the centerpiece of that revelation in Exodus chapter 34 is his grace and his truth, his steadfast love and his faithfulness. This rich word pair Bakum explores here at the cross. He shows us that the cross points to the love of God, his chesed, his charis, his agape. Chesed is one of those words from Exodus chapter 34. Charis and agape are both Greek nuances of this word, grace and unfailing love. This is the character of God that Moses heard on Sinai, now described in visible flesh on Golgotha, on Skull Hill. The paradox of the cross, honor in humiliation, visible splendor in disfigurement and death, exists to make us reckon with a love that is sufficient to resolve the paradox. Is this not paradoxical that God would show his steadfast covenant love his grace and his truth on this item of torture, this implement of death, this symbol of humiliation. How is God's glory, his character being shown at the cross? Well, you see, Richard Bauckham points us to another part of John's theology. As he is bathed in the imagery of the Old Testament, there are, are things that are, that are reminding him of Jesus. And he makes use of a concept from what's called a servant song in Isaiah. You've heard this before, but I think it's great to read this at length. And it begins with the exaltation, the raising up, the glorification of this servant who would suffer and die and be raised. Let's read this. See, my servant will act wisely. He will be raised and lifted up and highly exalted. Just as there were many who were appalled at him, his appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any human being and his form marred beyond human likeness, so he will sprinkle many nations and kings will shut their mouths because of him. For what they were not told, they will see, and what they have not heard, they will understand. Who has believed our message and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each one of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so did he not so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. Yet who of this generation protested? For he was cut off from the land of the living, for the transgression of my people he was punished. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer, and though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, 
he will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand after he has suffered. He will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sins of many and made intercession for the transgressors. What a rich passage. What we see here is that the glory of God, what he deems as, as worthy of exaltation, of worthy of being raised up, he's going to show the world through this suffering servant who will sprinkle. This is a priestly task to sprinkle and to make clean, but also be led like a lamb you see, the idea of bearing iniquities, that's sacrificial imagery. The picture that you draw to mind is a, is a lamb or a sheep or some sort of animal. The fact that, that Isaiah, in his own context, is, is, is in the Spirit writing and seeing what is going to come in the person of Christ, in the work of Christ, is talking about someone, a human, someone who is put on flesh, who is going to take sin away for us. This is all part of the glorious mystery of the nature of God, that God himself become man, become flesh, and take away our suffering, suffer on our behalf, that he would be pierced for our transgressions, that he'd be crushed for our sins, that his wounds would heal us. That is the grand mystery of the paradox of the cross. This is the glory of God. This is what covenant love looks like. It looks like his substitutionary sacrifice. It looks like the victory of the resurrection. That he would take his spoils. That he would have an inheritance. That he would have offspring. We are adopted as children of God because of the work of Christ. Isn't this a grand mystery? I know it's it's strange language and it's strange customs and, and you, you have to think of, of the sacrificial system and understanding the significance of that and, and trying to understand what, it, what the, the people there seeing, this humiliating act of torture and death, that this, this is how we see the glory of God. This is how we see his character. This is what Moses heard about on Sinai now being lived out on the cross. Behold the glory of God. It is indeed a grand mystery, the character of God as it's seen on the cross. And I think the best response to these meditations that Bacham has helped us see in the text of John, that this hour of suffering would reveal the glory of God, his character, his nature, his covenant love. Perhaps the best response is a prayerful meditation. Can I invite you into a spiritual practice? I would like again to return to the idea of Visio Divina, to find a cross to meditate on. I'll leave one here after this slide is over for you to pause or to let play. Read aloud the seminal name of God from Exodus 34, 6 through 7. As you read about his covenant love, his steadfast love, his faithfulness, how do you see that? Played out on the cross. Read aloud the servant song from Isaiah 52 13 through 53 12, as we've just done. Would you read it again? Look upon the cross. Pray to God to see his glory in the crucifixion. So, some explorations for discussion for journaling. How do you see the character of God on display, glorified at the cross? Discuss and journal on how God is glorified in Christ's work on the cross. If this is what ultimate glory looks like, how should we respond? So may we fix our eyes on the cross and see the glory of God that we would see his character, his love, his mercy, his justice afresh paradox of 
the suffering servant. Godspeed.